Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Welcome to another great Australian Water School webinar. So glad to have you here today. And we'll be talking about the future of water quality modeling and what a topic it is. 200 years ago, Benjamin Franklin said, in wine, there's wisdom, in beer, freedom, in water, bacteria. <laughs> Hence the importance of today's webinar and the critical nature of it. Look at that. Wonderful to see you all here across the entire world. Very good to see. A really good spread of people joining us today. Fantastic. Today's presenter is Michael Barry with two colleagues, Mitchell Smith and Louise Bruce. Let's get this cranking. Good to see you, Mitchell. Good to see you, Michael. Louise, okay. there up in uh, sunny Queensland, I understand, north of Australia. That's right. Great. Louise is over in Perth. Ah, Louise. Lovely to have you join us. Michael Barry, just to introduce now formally, Michael Barry is part of the Two Flow team at BMT, has over 25 years' experience working in environmental water quality assessment. And during his time, he successfully managed and led a wide range of environmental studies in Australia and overseas. Today, Michael leads the water quality development within BMT's Australia's software business. He also continues to provide advice related to innovation to the wider BMT team. Mitchell Smith at Two Flows, an associate principal engineer and leads Two Flows FV's software development. Louise Bruce is BMT, a principal engineer with 25 years experience in environmental modeling. Have we got the A team? What do you think, Michael? <laughs> this is the A team. We try, Trevor. We try. <laughs> we try. I love it. Nice, Mitchell. Lovely to see you, Louise, there also in uh, WA. Now, Michael's going to present 45 minutes. Uh, Mitchell and Louise, you'll be ready and raring to go with, yep, with uh, t uh, typing answers to your questions or comments. So get them in early, get them in often. That'd be great. Right. Thank you for doing this pre-webinar poll. It really helps us in um, delivery and thinking about where we're going with this. Uh, so here it is on screen right now. What sector are you from? Mostly from commercial consulting. We would have expected that. And secondly, from government policy planning. What do you think, Michael? Yep. Makes sense. Expected. And then uh, good spread of modeling software, hydraulic modeling software. Third question, uh, hands-on modeling experience. Any comments here? There's a good good spread of uh, there is. different experience levels. And yeah, good to see such a yeah, large proportion of people that have been and doing this for a while, so yeah, it's good. Yep. Yeah, it is. So number four, what water quality mod modelling softwares do you use? I think so many people who have ticked other just to speak to the, the volume of, of water yeah. quality models that are out there globally. There's just so many, Louise. Yep. Yeah, get you. Right. So we've only listed a few here. <laughs> the software doesn't allow for more than 10 or 20. That's good. Number five, what water quality applications are you interested in? Uh, like reservoir management. We did feel that there'd be an aquaculture strength there, but it's high, but um, obviously estuarine, lake mm. and reservoir management's way, management's yeah. way up there. Interesting. Mm. Isn't Very it? good, isn't it? All right. Well, we'll leave it at that unless you've got any more comments. I think we're ready to launch into this. Over to you, Michael, and we're just keen to hear what you've got to say. As I said before, click the Q&A um, icon and put in your comments, questions. But for now, over to you, Michael. Very good. Thanks, Trevor. And thanks everyone for joining. I really appreciate uh, your time and uh, hopefully we can generate some great discussion. So today I will be presenting uh, some work that we've been doing in the, the two flow group and, and more, more broadly throughout the industry in terms of water quality modeling. I'm presenting obviously with Mitchell and Louise and, and Ian Tickle is also an author of two flow FV. So between the four of us, we're delivering these capabilities uh, into industry at the moment. And we just want to share some of what we're doing and, and see some, seek some feedback. Looking through the attendees list, uh, Trevor, I can see that we do have a lot of a lot of people who do have some background in water quality modelling, uh, in particle tracking modelling. But nonetheless, I will mm. still step through those modelling specialties and um, talk a little bit about them because it sets the scene for why we're doing what we're doing now in water quality modelling in two flow. So I'll talk a bit about water quality modelling and particle tracking modelling. And then I'll talk about what I think the status quo is in our industry globally at the moment in terms of the use of those two types of modelling approaches. Uh, and then I'll move on to some case studies of some advanced water quality modelling uh, applications that we've in the process of completing the moment uh, within the two-flow team. So what is water quality modelling? Well, it's, it's fair to say that in the environmental water modelling 
discipline. We have a wide range of models and that sort of came out in our pre-poll there a little bit too. Uh, we've got all sorts of different models to look at different parts of the water cycle and, and different specialists uh, look at different parts of the water cycle to address typical environmental questions around perhaps hydrologic issues, hydraulic issues around flood modelling or hydrodynamics in estuaries like we just saw in our pre-poll. Sediment transport gets looked at and waves and groundwater and plumes and all these different types of models help us to understand and simulate water movement or the physics of water in our natural environment or, or, our, or our built environment. And so because modelling has been around for a little while, there's a, there's a large range of these, these models available to us. But at the end of the day, simulating water movement is really about understanding the physics so water velocities, water depths, water temperatures and salinities and stresses, physical stresses in the water that we might be modelling to try and understand how that interaction occurs with our environment. And we might be doing that to look at particular environmental issues for regulators or for proponents looking at developments or coastal developments or whatever it might be. But we do have a wide range of models that help us look at the physics of water movement. However, once we move on to look beyond the physics of water movement and start to need to address and improve uh, and develop our understanding of ecological processes in our environment, we need a new suite of models. And those models we typically refer to as water quality models or ecological models. And rather than simulating water movement or physics, they really focus in on simulating water chemistry and ecology. They are informed in part by physical, so what we would have done in our, our flood modelling or our estuarine modelling in terms of physics, but they take the next step and they look at simulating environmentally important constituents such as dissolved oxygen, and we'll look a little bit in dissolved oxygen towards the end of the webinar today. Uh, certainly nutrients, organic matter, phytoplankton, uh, also known as algae, uh, zooplankton, pathogens, geochemistry and mine voids, all sorts of different applications where we need to move beyond just water movement and physics to water chemistry and ecological processes. And that's what we're referring to as water quality modelling. There's a wide range of constituents that are looked at. And, and as we found in our pre-webinar uh, pre poll, there's a lot of these water quality models out there. Uh, and some are in academia, some are in industry, some are sort of in between. But the basic premise of these models, these water quality models, is that we try to simulate ecologically relevant processes and pathways that can be characterised by dissolved quantities. And so the list I've got above here of different constituents, most of those are dissolved quantities. Dissolved oxygen is obviously dissolved, but also we have nutrients that are dissolved and organic matter, um, if it's soluble, is dissolved. And that's what water quality models try to simulate, is that that dissolved um, fate and transport of dissolved constituents. So... What questions do we try and ask of water quality models? This is not an exhaustive list by any means, um, but the things that we might ask of water quality models are if we were to uh, load, a load an estuary with some nutrients coming from a wastewater treatment plant discharge, for example, how much can we load that estuary with nutrients before it starts to not meet its environmental objectives? Or if we treated some stormwater in a catchment that was an urban catchment with wetlands, for example, how would we design those wetlands and what impact would the design of that wetland have on the delivery of cleaner or, or less clean water to downstream receiving water bodies and, and what, would, what would the impact on the water quality of those bodies be? Looking at reservoirs is a, is a typical application of water quality models and, and really algal blooms are of interest in reservoir models because if water supply reservoirs uh, have significant algal blooms, then they may not be able to supply water to the quality required. So, so using water quality models to simulate algal activity in reservoirs is, is pretty common and very important. Certainly, there's an there's a interest recently uh, in the last couple of years about simulating pathogens and their interaction of pathogens with uh, human aquatic recreational areas. So we, we don't want inflows from catchments or, or treatment plants to be interacting with known recreational areas uh, with swimmers, for example, if those, those inflowing waters are, are heavily laden with pathogens um, because it poses obvious health risks. And we'd use water quality models to look at those sorts of issues. And something that's come on the, on the radar a little bit in Australia recently in the last couple of years is really trying to understand the geochemistry of coal mine final voids. So open cut coal mines, if they fill up with water when they're finished, what is the water chemistry in those voids and how does it behave and how does it impact the downstream environment if it was to overflow? All these sorts of questions are 
are not really about water physics, they're about water chemistry. And that's what water quality modeling typically is. And in fact, when we're looking at environmental processes, because we might be trying to assist uh, a, a government regulator with assessing the environmental impacts of a proposal, or we might be trying to assist a developer to understand the impacts of a urban development or a coastal development, what we typically do in a fairly linear fashion from left to right across the screen here, we firstly set up a model of the physics, and we talked about those earlier, that's water movement, water flow, velocities, depths, those sorts of things, and we'd calibrate that model. And then we would run a series of water quality models that took information from the physical model, the, the, the hydrodynamic model, and looked at the impacts of a change or an existing process on water quality in a particular environment of interest. And we might run several scenarios around that to see if we varied particular parameters in the water quality model, or we looked at different boundary conditions or different climatic conditions, what happens to water quality under certain development conditions perhaps, but we would run a series of scenarios and the outcomes from those scenarios would then be used to inform management decisions around a particular environmental issue that was being investigated. Now, of course, we never just use numerical models to inform management decisions, but models are often a very important part of helping to inform those decisions uh, and, and help regulators or developers or whoever it might be come to a decision about, about next steps in a particular environmental setting. So it really is very much similar to physics first in a, phys in, a, in a hydrodynamic model, then move to a water quality model using the outputs from the physics and then use those scenarios from a water quality model to look at supporting management decisions. The summary of what a water quality model is and how they might be used is that really we try and simulate concentrations of environmentally important constituents and we refer to these, these dissolved constituents as Eulerian uh, or cell-based quantities. That means that we're looking at concentrations of constituents in a model cell, in a numerical model cell. They do relate primarily to dissolved quantities, but not always. So we, we'll try and simulate, for example, phytoplankton or algae as a concentration in a water quality model. Now, algae or phytoplankton are, are not dissolved. They're discrete entities, but we still try and simulate those as concentrations uh, in water quality models more often than not. And similarly for shrimp or fish, we, we sometimes in a water quality model will treat those as dissolved constituents when clearly they're not. They're, they're individual entities that, that are not dissolved, so behave differently to dissolved constituents. We reach this point where we say, well, we can do all this water quality modelling of, of dissolved constituents, but how do we properly account for things like phytoplankton or shrimp or fish that aren't really dissolved concentrations of constituents, that they're actually entities? Well, it leads us to particle modelling or particle tracking modelling. And that's what I want to talk about next. So we've talked about hydrodynamics or, or water movement modelling. And we've talked about concentrations for water quality modelling of, of environmentally relevant constituents. Now we're talking about what we do if the things that we'd like to model are not dissolved. We use particle tracking models. And particle tracking models, they actually simulate individual entities. So you can think of them as particles or dots in the water column. And they get advected around with the flow and, and, and other factors, which we'll talk about in a second. But we would adopt or use water um, particle tracking modeling if we we're looking at processes around fish or crustaceans or shrimp or prawns, um, fish larvae, turtle hatchlings. We've certainly used particle tracking to simulate turtle hatchlings in the past and quite recently. Um, quite a significant application in aquaculture around simulation of, of overfeed or, or wasted feed or, or, or aquaculture waste, which is also pelletized, um, overboarded shipping containers, uh, uncontrolled lost vessels, all these sorts of things that are not well represented by um, dissolved concentrations or, or quantities. That's what we'd use particle tracking modeling for. This is not an exhausting list at all, exhaustive list at all. Um, there are many others, but this is just to give you a flavor for what we might use particle tracking uh, modeling for. So when, when we do these, when we set these particle tracking models up, we have the particles injected into the flow. As you can see, there are just an example animation on the right of particles getting pushed around in a flow. They get transported by um, waves, by wind drift, uh, as well as the, the bulk flow field. Um, they can be modified by um, buoyancy, by settling, decay, sedimentation, resuspension from the bed, all, all those sorts of processes that might occur in reality for the things that we're trying to simulate as particles. They can be dispersed horizontally and vertically, uh, and usually we, we use some sort of random walk model to, to add that dispersion. 
Um, and if particles end up on dry land, not in water, then we can set them to crawl and we can uh, have them crawl uh, with um, a particular behaviour that's preset by a user. And certainly we did that in some recent modelling of, of turtle hatchlings um, in, um, in Australia. Uh, we, we use that crawling capability to, to see what happens with turtles um, as they reach dry land. But the basic premise, as a parallel to the water quality modelling, the basic premise of particle tracking modelling is that we simulate the processes and pathways that can't be characterised by dissolved quantities. So water quality modelling is dissolved quantities. Particle tracking is, as the name suggests, particles. And when we're using particle tracking modelling to look at particular environmental settings or, or scenarios or developments, again, we would typically take a left to right approach across this slide, which would be simulate the physics first, which is water movement and, and wind and waves and all those things we talked about before. Then we'd use those physics to inform particle tracking models simulations. And we would again, like we did for water quality modeling, we'd probably do a series of scenarios with different particle properties to look at how different scenarios might play out or situations might play out given different properties of those particles. And those properties might be around buoyancy or motility or, or um, uh, wind drift properties, those sorts of things. And then we've done those scenarios. We'll then collate those, understand what they're telling us about a potential or existing environmental situation. And we would again, use that outcomes to inform management decisions. So it's a similar process as to water quality modeling, but we're using particles here to look at different sorts of environmental issues. So really we're talking about particle-based dynamics and the term used for particle tracking modeling is Lagrangian. Uh, so we've got Eulerian for concentration-based water quality modeling and we've got Lagrangian for particle-based tracking modeling. They're not dissolved quantities in Lagrangian. Uh, they are actually particles that are moved by all the physics we've just talked about. So that's the background to water quality modeling and particle tracking modeling. Now, the reason that I've done that is because I'd like to talk a bit about where I think we are generally as an industry in terms of environmental modelling in this space at the moment. It's definitely true to say that both Eulerian and Lagrangian or water quality and, and particle-based modelling tools have been around for a long time. There's no secrets about that. And they've been increasing in complexity as time has gone by. But I guess typically, not always, but typically we've had, like we said before, we've had the water quality modelling forced by the hydrodynamics and we've had particles forced by the hydrodynamics. As per the diagram I've got here on this slide where we have hydrodynamic modelling informing particle tracking modelling and hydrodynamic modelling informing water quality modelling, but only in a one-way direction. There's no feedback between water quality and hydrodynamics or particle tracking and hydrodynamics. That can be a bit restrictive in the sorts of issues that we can look at. And whilst there has been particle tracking and water quality modelling around for a long time, I think it's my view that the feedbacks between particles and hydrodynamics and water quality and hydrodynamics and even particles and water quality, which we'll look at shortly, just haven't quite been there as in our traditional analyses. And I think that that's an area that we can do much better in. So typically I've listed here the one, one directedness, the one wideness of these, of these types of, of simulation methods, which is water quality responds to hydros, particles respond to hydros, but particles and water quality don't modify hydros and they don't modify each other. There are some exceptions. So this is, I'm not saying that we've never done any sort of two-way connections between these models. I'm not saying that at all. There are some exceptions. And one of those is um, a relatively niche field of oil spill modeling. We can have water quality influencing hydrodynamics. Um, and we certainly have seen in the water quality modeling space around the world, uh, some uh, implementation of, of shading, a water column shading by phytoplankton blooms over time. So in a reservoir, if there was a phytoplankton bloom predicted, that bloom would then shade the water beneath it and stop heat transfer to depth and therefore affect stratification and hydrodynamics. So we have certainly seen some of these in the past, um, but it's not, um, they're not often in commercial uh, applications and they're often niche applications uh, that, that don't make it out into the mainstream. And, and I guess what I'm saying in this webinar is we really, I think as a, as a modelling community, need to really make those next steps from this one-way unidirectional sort of approach uh, in, in water quality modelling and particle tracking modelling to a, a two-directional approach that is run-of-the-mill every day taken for granted rather than being exceptional. And that's why I'll show you a couple of examples um, about what I mean there in a second. Not only uh, have we not seen too much uh, two-way communication between these models, we really are moving on in terms of um, expectations of the industry and compute power. So 
in days gone by, and they, and they were quite some days gone by, 1D or one, one-dimensional hydrodynamic models were okay. Uh, and now 3D models are expected in water quality modelling world. We, we can't really get away with anything less than 3D these days unless we have a really, really well-mixed environment that doesn't warrant it. But but even so, it's it's rare that we would we would propose or offer to undertake two-dimensional modelling when 3D is just the norm these days. Um, and we've moved from quite a quite a basic understanding of our natural environment, perhaps in the 70s and 80s, where we look at total nutrients in a system and generic phytoplankton species right through to where we are now, which is we have so much more scientific understanding of multitrophics uh, and we increasingly better, uh, well understand our, our natural systems in terms of interactions of different systems with each other. And on top of all that, underlying everything that we do all day, every day now in our, in our world is that compute power has increased dramatically. Uh, once we'd simulate on on, on CPUs or, or central processing units and we'd use our desktop computers, and now graphics processing units or GPUs are expected because they're so much faster. Uh, and blade arrays or cloud or cloud compute really are asked after or, or required in, in modeling projects. So we've really moved in terms of our understanding and our ability to simulate our natural environment. Um, and, and I guess I'm suggesting we need to move our, our, our philosophy towards water quality and particle tracking model, modeling along with that. So what I'm proposing is that we, we think uh, more, um, less of what I have on the left-hand side here, which is a diagram I showed before, which is where hydrodynamics feed into water quality and particle tracking. We try and transition over to the right-hand side where we've got feedback loops beginning between, in this instance, particle tracking and water quality. Um, I'm going to go beyond that in this presentation, but initially that's a good place to look where we have particle tracking simulations actually feeding back into water quality. Uh, and that's something that is right on the radar for us now uh, at, at BMT right at the moment. Uh, we are undertaking in, an innovation project with um, the UK Seafood Innovation Fund. Uh, and here's a, a screen grab of the, of the website, of our project on the website. And um, we're in collaboration with Scottish Sea Farms, Marine Scotland Science, Aquaterra and the, and the Scottish EPA, Environment Protection Agency. We are currently, um, in fact, we're just about finished um, developing a um, capability in our particle tracking model so that we can simulate sea lice uh, in, in Northern Scotland. And we can specifically simulate sea lice responding dynamically or on the fly to temperature and salinity and light. So we have the hydrodynamic model feeding into the particle tracking model, not just in terms of water movement, but also in terms of um, the physical the salinity, temperature and, and light and having that affect where particles go when those particles represent sea lice. So we are definitely moving in this direction and, and there, are, there are live projects at the moment that are, that are all about this. Um, so so it's, I think we're taking good first steps, but I think we need to bring this sort of thinking um, eventually from not being innovation projects to actually being mainstream and just how we do things. So, so what I'd like to do is talk, talk you through a couple of case studies or examples of the types of modeling applications that I think we can step into relatively um, efficiently and start answering the next level of environmental questions in terms of their complexity. I'd like to talk about um, firstly, management of dissolved oxygen in shrimp farms or shrimp ponds. And I'll talk a bit about the migration of salmon. And what we'll do is we'll use water quality models and particle tracking models that talk to each other so that we can better simulate and understand the dynamics of these two environmental processes. So I'll talk about uh, question one, which is DO or dissolved oxygen dynamics in, in shrimp ponds. So just a bit of background, uh, land-based aquaculture um, uses grow-out ponds to develop shrimp from um, hatchling size to saleable size. And, and these ponds are constructed and they're typically regular in their shape and size. They're up to hundreds of metres in hor horizontal dimension and, you know, several metres deep at their deepest point. But maintenance of oxygen in the ponds is critical because obviously our friends here in the in the video, they need oxygen to survive. Uh, and um, if, if farmers see repeated low dissolved oxygen events, then it's gonna impact their yield of prawns as well, or shrimp. So, so the prawns do consume oxygen because they breathe. Um, and also um, shrimp waste uh, and overfeed 
also consume oxygen when they're broken down in the environment. So we've got a couple of sinks here of oxygen that need to be maintained and, and managed very carefully so we don't interfere with our, our, our prawn um, uh, growing, uh, our aquaculture processes. So, so what I've done is I've, I've built a couple of demonstration models um, to look at how vertical shrimp migration might lead to dissolved oxygen issues in ponds um, and therefore how might shrimp, shrimp respond to those low DO issues. So I'm trying to get at the, the, the two-way connection between hydrodynamics, particle tracking and water quality. Um, so what I've done is I've set up the prawns or the shrimp to migrate vertically uh, during on a diurnal cycle. Uh, so each day and what I've set them to do is that they swim downwards away from light, away from visible light uh, to depth during the day for, to, to seek safety from surface predators. Now I'm not suggesting that this is um, the only way that shrimp behave or necessarily the correct way that shrimp behave. It's a demonstration of a, of a concept um, around how we might use particles to, to simulate shrimp in, in a water quality context. Um, and I would stress that the, the algorithms that I've, that I've put into this model are all user definable. So if we wanted to use different algorithms, it's a simple matter to do that. Um, this, is, this is simply to show the connections that I'm talking about, about where I think our industry needs to go in terms of linking particles and water quality. In the past, we have used the, the familiar diagram I've got here on the left. We've used a bit of a one-way street between hydrodynamics and particles and hydrodynamics and water quality. What the current needs of this shrimp application um, is, is that we don't just force a particle model with hydrodynamics, which is water flow velocities and, um, and, and water surface elevations and, and wind drift and those sorts of things, but we also use physicals, which is light and temperature and salinity to force where particles go, that when those particles do what they do, they swim somewhere else, that those particles consume oxygen because that's what prawns do. So we go from the left-hand side where we had to make inferences around a particle tracking water quality model linkage to actually be able to simulate it explicitly and say, well, this is what we think is going to happen when the prawns do this, this, and this, and they consume oxygen here in the in the pond or there in the pond. And so that's where we're going with this, this, this demonstration here. So what I've done is I've set up the particles in this particular model, which I'll show you the, the, the model domain in a second. I've set particles to respond to hydrodynamics, but also to temperature and to light. And I refer to light as PAR, which is photosynthetically active radiation, PAR. I've also set particles to consume oxygen at a user-defined rate, which is variable. Um, and that the, the, the prawns or the shrimp will, will migrate vertically on a daily basis and, and will interact, the, the particles and water quality will interact within these ponds. In terms of the particles, um, I've set them to, to swim directly downwards once a PAR or light threshold has been exceeded. And once that, that light threshold is no longer exceeded, they can move back up into the water column. I've also set the, the shrimp to crawl. If, they, if they're swimming downwards and they hit a side of the pond or the bottom of the pond, they can crawl laterally and downwards to the deepest parts of the pond. So there's a crawling element to this as well. Um, and once they're at the bottom of the pond, they can migrate freely. The oxygen consumption, so it's the other side of the coin, not the particle tracking model, but the, but the oxygen side of things, the water quality model side of things. Um, I've set up the prawns to consume oxygen based on a normal distribution, which I've got on the right-hand side here, which is all user-definable between a minimum temperature and a maximum temperature. And it's simply specifying a maximum um, oxygen consumption rate um, per, per gram of, of shrimp biomass. And those sorts of numbers are in the, are in the literature for us to access. And, and that um, that consumption rate depends on temperature. So at very low temperatures, the consumption will drop as, we, as it will drop also in high temperatures. But in mid-range temperatures, there'll be optimal uptake when the prawns are really enjoying growing uh, in, in favourable conditions. So that's my T-min, T-opt and T-max on the right-hand side. And again, this is not set in stone. This is just an algorithm that I came up with to force our model. It's user-definable and exchangeable to whatever a user would, would, might, uh, would, would want to simulate. That's the particles with their migration. And the, and the oxygen consumption and what this is going to do is put those two together and see what happens. This is the model domain. Um, the, the pink dots are shrimp in their initial state when I kick the model off 
And the color contours, which you can see here, um, they're bottom PAR, so, so light at the bottom of the model. And you can see the dimensions of the pond there. It's, it's uh, rectangular and, and I've augmented the dimensions in the vertical. Uh, it's about three meters deep and about 100 meters in the longest dimension vertical, uh, horizontally. But like I said, I have exaggerated the vertical scale for presentation purposes only. Now I'm going to play an animation now of some of the beginning part of a simulation where I have the prawns or the shrimp initialized as you can see here, um, but they respond as I've described in terms of light. Now the color contours are, are described as per the color bar on the left hand side. So yellow is 25 watts per square meter and blue is zero. I'm starting the model at blue, it's, it's the middle of the night. Um, so there's no radiation, there's no PAR in the system at the moment, but you'll see very shortly after I start it, you'll see the color contours start to go from blue through to yellow uh, and, the, and the particles will move downwards. Now, the PAR does go above 25 in this simulation, but I've just set the color contour to be 25 because that's the threshold that I set in the simulations for particles to respond to. So when you see the colors go yellow, that means that the prawn should go down, um, even though the PAR values are higher. So I'll play this now, and um, you should see the shrimp are swimming away from the light as soon as our color contours go to yellow. And then the prawns or the, the shrimp that hit the side of the dam, uh, the pond, sorry, they, they start crawling downwards. And you can see them migrating downwards. They're away from the light as fast as they can um, because that's what we've coded them up to do. So. This is, a, this is first steps in getting particles to respond to hydrodynamics beyond just water movement. They're responding to, to light. And, and so what I'm gonna do now is, is not show you the full three dimensional model results because they're, they're, they're um, more complicated to interpret visually. I'm gonna show you some cross sections of some, some simulations um, that we have um, prepared which is the same model, but it's a vertical slice that you can see here. So I've got Two simulations, um, it's a vertical slice from, from top to bottom. This is the top water level here. This is the bottom of the pond here, and this is the sloping sides. Um, the white dots you can see are shrimp. The color contours again are PAR, and they are um, as per the color bar on the right-hand side here. And, and now 25 is red. So when you see the water go red or the color contours go red, that means a particle should start to respond if I program to do so. Uh, so we have, um, uh, two simulations, the one on the left, the particles do not respond to PAR, and the one on the right, the particles do respond to PAR. Uh, we have a time of day stamp here, and just a printout of the surface PAR here that will change in time as I, sim as I start the animation. When these numbers here go red, it means the 25 has been exceeded and the particles should start to move. And you should be able to see the particles moving and that's the prawns are just moving around doing their thing um, because there's no PAR because the color contours are all blue. But as time goes by, um, the particles get into a bit of a, a bit of a routine there of a circulation, which is interestingly driven by natural convection. But you can see that the particles on the right hand side, they move downwards as a PAR hits red. And you can see them crawling down the sides of the, the pond to the bottom. Where they, are, where they seek safety. And um, once the PAR drops back below the threshold, the particles then move back up into the water column. So, so what this is, is a demonstration of particles responding, not just to physicals, but also to, uh, sorry, it's physical water movement, but also to physical water properties, such as light and temperature and salinity. And that's the first step in starting to link up particle tracking and water quality modeling. This, this simulation now is, is or this animation now shows two simulations and um, we are, we're not color contouring um, uh, PAR anymore. We're color contouring oxygen, oxygen concentrations. So what we have now is I'm, I'm showing you how not only will particles move down, um, but we will also see um, particles consume oxygen. So these are prawns, these particles are prawns or shrimp and they're consuming oxygen as they go. But on the left-hand side, we have particles that do not respond to PAR. So they stay up in the water column. But on the right-hand side, we have particles that do respond to PAR and they'll go down to the bottom. And you'll see as time goes by, you'll see that the color contours will go from red to orange, but then down at the bottom, you'll see that on the right-hand side, oxygen consumption will occur. And that's because the prawns are consuming oxygen. 
So we're going from red to sort of orange, and that's because the prawns consume oxygen because they're breathing. Um, and the, the left and right are pretty much the same because this PAR hasn't started yet. It's, it's not yet um, sufficiently light. But as the PAR increases, you'll see on the right-hand side, particles run down to the bottom and they consume oxygen as they go. And we start to see areas, pockets down the bottom there where oxygen concentrations drop to blue levels. Which is, which is much lower than the rest of the water column. And that's because the shrimp have aggregated at the bottom of the pond and developed these, low, these pockets of low dissolved oxygen. And then when the PAR drops uh, back below the threshold level, the prawns go back up into the water column. So not only now do we have particles responding to light, but we have particles responding to light and consuming oxygen. And the key outcome here is that the figure on the left-hand side is what we would have got if we'd simulated particles not responding to light but consuming oxygen at the end of the, the simulation day. And on the right, we've got the different distribution of dissolved oxygen concentrations that we see if we simulate the prawns to do what we think they might do, which is go to the bottom and generate these low dissolved oxygen pockets that then mix up into the water column when the light, when, when nighttime comes, when, when it mixes vertically. So just by changing the motility or the vertical migration patterns of these, these shrimp or these particles, we see a very different outcome in terms of water quality model prediction. On the left, I'm not too worried because the water quality levels are pretty high throughout most of the most of the pond. It looks okay. On the right, I've generated some low dissolved oxygen water and it's mixed throughout my pond. And as a farmer, I might not be too happy about that. But that's only because we've changed the way that the particles respond to light. So this is important. This is not a trivial thing that we're looking at here. This is a real environmental process that we need to be modeling better, I think, in having these linkages between particles and water quality. It's even more than that, um, I think, that, and, and I'll show you what I mean by that, because what we've done just now is we've simulated water quality, but we've had particles impacting water quality, and that's shrimp consuming oxygen, namely at the bottom, um, particularly at the bottom of the ponds where they develop low DO pockets. So we've done that, but really, once these shrimp have developed these low oxygen pockets, are they really gonna stay there? They're not, because if they if they generate these low dissolved oxygen pockets, shrimp don't like being in low dissolved, dissolved oxygen areas. They need to breathe. So they're going to swim away from these pockets. So what we really need is not just to have the particle tracking model inform water quality models, but also the reverse. So we need to say, well, particles, if water quality drops below a particular um, criteria in terms of oxygen, then particles move away. Don't, don't stay in that area because we know that prawns won't do that because they don't like it because they'll die. They would rather be in, in environments of higher light than they would environments of lower dissolved oxygen. So why don't we try and simulate that and really close that two-way loop between particle tracking and water quality? And that's what I've done. So this now shows again color contours of dissolved oxygen. But on the left-hand side, we have prawns that um, they will go to the bottom. They'll respond to light but they will not respond to lowering of dissolved oxygen. On the right-hand side, we have the same simulation, but once the prawns get to the bottom, they start consuming oxygen and, and generating low DO pockets. You'll see them move away from those pockets. And that's because the water quality model has been set up to inform and drive the particle tracking model to give us that next level of reality in terms of simulation of our shrimp. Uh, and again, I'll play it, but the color contours again are dissolved oxygen. But both sides respond to light, but only the right-hand side has the shrimp responding to low dissolved oxygen pockets that are developed. So getting towards the light returning, <clears throat> on the right-hand side, you see the particles move downwards as on the left-hand side, but they're all scampering down the sides of the pond to get to the bottom, but you'll see the particles start to jump up above the low dissolved oxygen areas. And that's because they're trying to get away from those areas they've created. And you'll see there's quite a different distribution in prawns from the right to left-hand side at that time. And that's because on the right-hand side, we have the particles shying away from low dissolved oxygen areas that they've created. So it really is that, that two-way linkage between particles and oxygen and, and hydrodynamics. And that's where I think we need to be heading pretty quickly in our industry to start answering these sorts of questions 
that our customers, at least at BMT and TwoFlow, are asking us right now, um, which is how do I manage oxygen in my prawn ponds? How do I do that? How do I um, not develop areas of, of low dissolved oxygen in my ponds and, and how do I therefore not impact my, my shrimp? Um, how do I set my, another question is, how do I set up my, um, my paddles in my ponds so that I can better accumulate feed or overfeed and waste to minimize um, cleaning costs and minimize the amount of oxygen that that waste and overfeed will take out of the, out of the um, water column? How do I do that? Well, we need to use particles for the overfeed and the waste and dissolved oxygen and link them together in a water quality particle tracking model. Um, and, and just beyond oxygen, there's obvious questions about carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus as well that we can see in these, in these ponds that we need to be very aware of in managing, managing them optimally. So, so our customers are asking us these questions right now which is why we're responding in this way. And I think this is where we need to go uh, and, and pretty quickly in our industry. All right, second case study, a um, couple of minutes to go. I'm almost finished. Um, migrating salmon. Uh, we all know, I think, that salmon migrate upstream uh, when they spawn. Um, they do have different depth and temperature seeking behaviours, um, but it's come to the attention of uh, researchers and regulators that in some parts of the world, salmon are becoming stressed by heat, by, by unusually warm waters in the rivers that they typically migrate up. And so one plan or one proposal is to develop or, or build artificial or constructed uh, cold water refuges, refuges on the sides of these rivers that, that prawn, uh, sorry, that sh uh, salmon are known to swim upwards and, and give the salmon the opportunity to go and have a rest in one of these cool water embayments that's been constructed before they continue spawning. So the question automatically arises, how do we design these things? Where do we put them? How do we know the salmon will swim into them or not? And how do we best locate them so that we do get that maximum number of salmon swimming into these things um, after being able to detect them in the estuaries or rivers that we're simulating? So we've got particles interacting again with hydrodynamics because the particles are swimming upstream. And we've also got particles interacting with physicals, which is temperature, uh, water temperature in this case. So um, the requirement was that we have these particles uh, represent salmon. The salmon swim against the current they seek out local temperature gradients. So salmon can sense gradients in temperature and they can head towards cooler waters if they so desire. If they're feeling stressed because of heat, they can sense the temperature gradients and move towards cooler water. And so what we need in our model is the ability for these particles to respond to those temperature gradients and have the track of the particles altered from being purely upstream, but to have the direction slightly changed so that it's, um, direct salmon into these cool water refuges. So what I did is I set up uh, an example model. Clearly, this is not a real river. Uh, it's, a, it's a constructed channel that I've used just for the simplicity of presentation. And water in this channel inflows from here, moves through the model and outflows here. Color contours are temperature as per the color bar. And right in here, I've put in a constructed cold water inflow. So I've built a berm through here in the model and I've got another inflow here, which is cold water coming in at this point, which is why the contours here are bluer. Uh, and then they move to sort of ready orange as they get further away as mixing occurs. So um, the dots I'm about to show you are passive traces. They're not salmon. I'm just showing you these particles as passive traces to show you what the flow field looks like. Um, so I'll play this. And, and this is the particles coming into the inflow end and they're flying around and around the cold water refuge. There's no temperature sensitivity of these particles. I'm just showing you these, you these so that you can see how the flow field is. What I'll show you now is salmon. So it's the same model, except I'm only presenting half of it here and I'm presenting four different panels. Um, I'm presenting um, the panel on the left is just a static panel that has the direction of velocity vectors in, this, in the system and temperature is a color contour as it is for all the other panels. And here's the color contour bar that tells you what colors are what temperatures. In each of these other three panels though, I will simulate salmon and they will start here at the outflow in all cases in exactly the same way. And they will swim upstream against the currents, except I've set the, sem the temperature sensitivity on this panel to be zero of these particles. I've set the sensitivity of these particles to be mild as they swim upstream. 
and these particles to be strong. And what we're going to see is differences in the number of salmon that end up in this cold water environment, just because of the way that we've, we've set up our particles to respond to temperature sensitivity. So here's the release point. Particles will move upstream and they'll move in different directions because of the different particle sensitivities to temperature. The number there, zero, and it increases is the number of particles that enter the refuge. So it, it's, it's really pretty, pretty clear that um, when we would put a strong temperature dependence on our particles as salmon, we get 1,800 uh, salmon entering this, this particular refuge. With no temperature sensitivity, you've got 80. So there's more orders of magnitude there difference. So when we're trying to design these things for salmon in the real world, we need to be making sure our particles are responding correctly. And that's what this example's all been about. So to wrap up, um, I think in the past and sort of now as well to an extent, requirements around environmental modelling, particularly water quality and particle tracking, are becoming more demanding. Regulators are asking harder questions and, and proponents are therefore asking harder questions of consultants and, and academics and researchers because regulators are demanding higher standards of analysis. And the ways we did things in the past with historical linear one directional analysis from hydrodynamics to water quality to uh, assessment of impacts, it's not really sufficient anymore. We need to start moving towards two-way integration of hydrodynamics, particle tracking and water quality to look at the sorts of real world issues that I've talked a little bit about today. And it goes without saying that we've really got to move um, onto the cloud uh, and um, have our GPU compute as everyday computation, no more CPU, it's too slow. The, the demands are too high and we need to move towards GPU. So what I'm really saying is we need to have this really nice two-way linkage between HD, PTM and WQ. And I think that's where we need to move, move very quickly on in industry. And maybe if we did that, we could simulate some of these guys, which are a catfish um, from far north Queensland um, when we were up there a couple of years ago. It's some um, footage my daughter took with a GoPro. So, so she had fun with that. And I did ask her permission to use this footage, by the way. Um, so anyway, that's, that's all I have, Trevor. Fantastic, Michael. And thanks for that extremely thought-provoking talk. Uh, obviously, the questions are reflecting that as well. Uh, what a great image at the end there by your daughter. That's, that's <laughs> I know. Really I was, she was good. very pleased. Yeah. She was really chuffed when I thought I was using it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, lo I love getting in the water and, and scoovering. Yep. And, and that just puts me there right there. Well, um, where should we begin? Uh, I, I thank you also, Mitchell and Louise, for your work on answering those questions. That's been really good. There's been lots of go through. So why don't we just kick off now with Alan Little's um, question there. Alan has said, how does salmon behave when ex exposed to heat, balsamic vinegar and olive oil? Is tasty. that a trick question? I think it is. It's very tasty. Yeah. yeah. On the Somebody barbecue. Is. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, I would say that this too can be done in Mike. Any, any thoughts? Uh, um, certainly the industry is moving in this direction. Yeah. I, I think what I'm, my, my point is that we need to be making this mainstream and as part of our thinking about how we um, approach the environment and environmental issues um, together with regulators and researchers and really start to make this a matter of course rather than something that's exceptional. Yeah, and I still yeah. think it's at that exceptional stage. Yeah. Are the current or existing water quality modelling techniques not sufficient or not accurate so that particle modelling is being developed? Um, I, I, I would never say that. I, I just mm. think that we're a, a product of our history. And I, and I think we've done really well to get to where we are. And I think that the tools we've had at our disposal um, have been fine. Um, and we've done the best we can with what we have. I think I'm saying that we need to move beyond where we are now and fairly rapidly because limitations around compute are becoming less and less every day as, as the cloud becomes more yeah. accessible and our understanding of natural processes is increasing. So I think it's just a natural progression of our industry. It's not a, yeah. not a matter of saying we didn't do well in the past. We did the best we could. Yeah, yeah for sure. Any comments, Mitchell, Louise, we're good. Yes, I was just actually answering that question when you answered. Yeah, absolutely, well it's yeah, all yeah. about being fit for purpose. So yeah. there's there are you know a, a billion and one water quality management questions that you will be using your model to answer. Of that billion and one, maybe a billion can be answered with what we have existing. But there are those questions that are coming, as Michael said, because we've got computational power that can take us way beyond what we thought was too complex. Say, look, we can't do that. We now can say yes. So there is a lot of movement around the world where we're developing these uh, these models to go beyond the kind of questions that we thought even yesterday were too complex. Yep. So yep. Yep. Yeah, it's about all about fit for purpose. Yeah. Yep. 
That's great. Um, and I understand, Mitchell and Louise, there are other questions you might have comments you want to make on. So you want to do that now or should we keep going for your questions? Uh, I've just been typing away like a, a maniac. Um, <laughs> I can imagine. Thanks, I can imagine. I've but been there, watching this. <laughs> that's all right. There is one question from Sanja, uh, which is kind of a direct um, cool. question about AD and AD traces that Michael would be best mm -hmm. to handle. But there, yeah. there's probably a few other ones there that Michael will be best to, yeah. to answer as well. Sorry. So does the two-flow FE STM overwrite the AED tracer? Is that the one, Mitchell? Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah, no, um, the way that TwoFlow uh, simulates AED is that TwoFlow considers AED to just be traces. AED does the non-conserved uh, non analysis and TwoFlow just does the transport. So uh, if we simulate traces in TwoFlow as traces, they do not overwrite the, the memory space for AED. You can do both. Uh, AED also does have in it the ability to simulate a tracer. Um, apart from two flows. So there's a couple of different options there, but they definitely don't conflict in that way. No. Well, let's press on, shall we? Philip Jordan has said, these results have impl implications for where and how often you monitor. Got any general comments about those issues? Phil, great to hear from you. Thanks for your question. Um, indeed, indeed, Phil. And and it's, it's it should be clear from what I presented that um, these are not calibrated models. But the next thing to do is get that calibration data to prove these out to make sure that we are actually getting these processes right in our um, our ponds or, or our or our reservoirs or estuaries. So indeed, with increasing complexity uh, and detail of questions from regulators and others, so does increase the the data requirements. And and we are certainly interacting with several customers at the moment who have already taken those next steps into real time sensing some of their ponds, prawn ponds, which is very cool. And and that sort of data is just so valuable for us as modelers and um, and developers to to work out how we tailor what we do um, um, in terms of replicating real processes. So absolutely data is an important part of this. And I think that we're starting to move in that direction, but again, there's a way to go. And collecting data is expensive. Everyone knows that. Um, instrumentation is expensive to buy and maintain. So there's always that balance between how much can we spend and how much data do we need. But but certainly it's one of the a critical elements in this space, most certainly, Phil. Next question by Owen uh, is, what's the, what are the differences between Music Mic 2 and 2Flow WQ? Uh, well, Big Music, one. yeah, yeah, I, I can speak to that. <clears throat> um, music is um, stands for... Uh, model for uh, urban stormwater improvement and conceptualization. And it really, uh, over the years, has been focused towards um, understanding the quantity and quality of stormwater generated on urban and, and non-urban areas and, and using that information to do things like uh, size and design, treatment wetlands, uh, and those sorts of things. Um, uh, basically to predict the quality and quantity of water coming off mainly urbanised areas, but not always, not necessarily. So, so music sort of stops before the stormwater gets into the receiving waterway, before it gets into the creek or the estuary or the reservoir or whatever it might be. Um, it provides boundaries, I suppose, to those receiving models. And, and AED is a receiving model um, where it simulates in stream or in estuarine or in lake water quality processes using sometimes boundaries from music, other times other models are used. Um, so, so the processes that AED simulates are quite different to those that music simulates because music is about pollutant generation from land use um, and pollutant export. AED is about transformation and of those pollutants and algal growth and, and uh, pathogen decay and, and all those sorts of things in, in environmental receiving systems. And, and Mike is similar in its uh, water quality model to, to AED in that conceptual uh, sense. Martin has said, I have a history in abalone aqu aquaculture they are surface living different species, go up and down, down current, waste goes downstream, so does food, but not so fast. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see these three particles modelled. We had to build prototype tanks back in the day and use time-lapse camera. So you yeah. have some comments on that, I guess. Sure, yeah. And and like I said, these shrimp that are modelled, they might not be real. It's a concept, a demonstration of a concept. And my main emphasis there is that Really, all the hard work to get to a point where we can simulate these things has been done. Changing the algorithms that, 
determine behaviour. It's it's a very, very simple job to do that, to simulate abalone or abalone waste or whatever it might be. So those algorithms, if we know those in environmental sense, it's a very simple matter to then code those in and away we go and, and they're user specified. I will say that, um, and just in relation to that, I will say that the next step again, I think from here is not just having a particle tracking model feedback to a water quality model or hydrodynamic model, but to have a particle tracking model um, with a particular group of particles that might represent shrimp, have them under certain conditions, environmental conditions, spawn a new group of particles that might be prawn waste, for example. So if there was if there was abalone generating waste and they behave those particles behave differently to the abalone we would have a model that spawned new particles at a particular time and they did whatever they had to do in terms of waste dynamics and that baloney went away and did something else. That's the next step, I think, along logical step along the way and, and that's where we're starting to go at the moment as well. Sounds good. Oh, well, we're getting close to the hour and there's a lot of thank yous coming in here. Thanks. Uh, Kundan made a comment there. Well presented, Michael. Animations are thought-provoking. That's great. Uh, maybe we'll take this last question then from Gus. Does two-flow um, water quality model high temperature plumes in shallow waters, am I getting this right? Where light purates into the water column, absorb at the bottom of once thermal. No, I haven't got the sense of this at all. Do you see the one there from Gus, uh, Michael, Mitchell? Um, I can't see them. Does the two flow water column quality model higher temperature plumes it's, in it's, shallow water? I think the question, sorry, is, is, is about how you've got um, warm water convective uh, cooling from the surface but if you also had like a jet of really warm water coming in could you also have that sort of convective that sort of whole overturning process as well so michael i, I started to answer that one but i'm going to leave it to you because I, I think that the, the cooling uh, water that yeah. uh, previously would be the answer there yeah, so indeed, um, two-flow will take account of temperature effects on density and salinity effects on density uh, and um, sediment effects in density, actually. And um, even in the absence of wind stirring, um, that can generate currents. So you might have seen in some of the simulations the prawns going up and down. That was only because of cooling of the surface waters and the, and the water coming down as a result and bringing the prawns of the shrimp with it. So indeed, those processes are covered. If there was a thermal plume that was being discharged from a power station, for example, um, we can certainly simulate that in two-flow. That's, that's no problems at all. And we've, we've done that many times um, as we have with desalination plant brine uh, return water discharges. Um, We'd simulate the very fine details of the diffuser dynamics in another package, but then provide three-dimensional um, time series boundaries to two-flow to then simulate the broader spread of those plumes, again, responding to temperature and salinity in terms of density dynamics. Great. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Louise. Thanks, Michael. This last question, has the approach been applied for recirculating systems? Um, not to my knowledge, no. No, but certainly we have some customers in the Middle East that we're talking with that have these sorts of systems, land-based um, RAS systems. So, um, yeah, we, we are in conversations at the moment, but not to my knowledge, it hasn't actually been done. I think we're there. Thank you very much. This has been great. Any, any other uh, comments you'd like to make or any questions you wanted to, to uh, readdress, Mitchell, Louise, from what you've been answering offline or online? I was just going to say we're actually in the process. Look, these things are the 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 process is going so fast that we are actually doing RAS systems at, at the moment. We're in discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the interest has been generated so fast. We're, we're going faster than the, than the software. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. That, the same principle that applies in the open ocean absolutely yeah. can apply in a closed system as well. Yeah. 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 I think there's really, some really good questions. And thanks everyone for, for asking those. And I um, yeah, mm -hmm. appreciate that. Uh, Appreciate that. And if you have any other questions, then yeah, feel free to flick those through and we'll aim to answer all of those if we can. So. Yep. Thanks, everyone, for coming along. Yeah, really That's wonderful. It. Yeah. Uh, but just to say thanks so much, Michael, Mitchell, and Louise. And, and to say that the Two Flow BMT team were awarded for being in the top 20 most innovative companies. And it's obvious from today's discussion just why that's come about. Well deserved for sure. Thanks again to uh, Joel and Jess out at the Australian Water School doing, the, doing everything that makes this work. It's been great. And you can see there the enormous amount of opportunity for training and professional development in the on demand courses, webinars, and live training. So stay tuned to the, the website for that, for the Australian Water School website for all that. Once again, thanks everybody for joining us. It's been a great hour or so. 
and for Two Flow team, BMT team, Michael, uh, Mitchell, and Louise. Thanks so much for everybody joining us. Pleasure. So, until next time, see you then. Thanks, Trevor. Bye, Thanks everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative, and critical advances in water science, technology, and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge, and learn from leading experts in water, visit theaustralianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.